place where I'm sitting is a sort of attic. It's a place where they, where tomatoes are dried and stored, all the fruits, uh, maize, corn, wheat are kept. Most of it was empty when I came, so that I had the whole of it. It was large. I used to sleep up here very often, and I also used to spend the mornings reading. It was a wonderful view over the whole of the village and over the distant mountains. It was a perfect place for peace, tranquility, meditation. Those who have been to Granada will know that immediately to the south of it there is a high range of mountains, the Sierra Nevada, which has snow on it all the year round. On the other side of these mountains, between them and the sea, lies a stretch of country, well watered and planted with villages, which is known as the Alpujarra. It was a broken, barren country, burnt a pale gold by the sun, and spotted with irregular patches of oak scrub and dry thistle stalks. A rough estimate of the present population of the Alpujarra, including the Valle de Decrim, gives 150,000 persons, living in some 80 pueblos, 40 hamlets, and a small number of isolated farms and cortijadas. This population has been kept fairly constant since 1870 by periodic immigrations to South America. down by 81 years of living, hardly capable of surprise any longer, slow in his movement, the English anthropologist has come back after 55 years to the village of Jägen, which was his home between 1919 and 1924. Compared to its neighbors, Valor and Mithina, the geographical characteristic of Jägen was its airy situation. Jutting out a little from the mountain and lying, its height above the sea was 4,000 feet, between the orange and the chestnut zones. Economically, it was its poverty. Although the land was good and well watered, and although almost every family had their plot or terrace, it lacked the usual nucleus of well-to-do people. The sort that is who shaved every Saturday night and on Sundays put on leather shoes and a tie. For the same reason it lacked the occasional big house with its tiled roof or walls of brick. All its architecture was primitive and better. those years spent in Jägen, Gerald Brennan wrote South from Granada, a sociological and anthropological work which will prove both a model and a rewarding study for those engaged in research into the lives and customs of communities. Spain and the Spanish people impressed young Brennan so greatly that he not only decided to stay in Andalusia, but that everything he wrote since, during half a century, is about Spain. The Spanish labyrinth, the face of Spain, the literature of the Spanish people, and his autobiography, recently published under the title of A Life of One's Own, show tremendous efforts made by a non-Spanish author to understand the soul of one of the most contradictory and paradoxical people of Europe. During the last 50 years, Brennan has observed the Spanish people with the curiosity of a child and the severity of a scientist. He has known Spain during all kinds of regimes, under the monarchy of Alfonso XIII, the dictatorship of Primo de Rivera, the chaos of the Republic.
He is familiar with the Spain of the Civil War between 1936 and 1939, and with Spain at peace during the last 35 years under Franco. Four generations have filed past his eyes. Not only his friends in the village of Jägen have died, but also many of the English intellectuals who used to visit him in his retreat south of Granada, like Lytton Strachey, David Garrett, Roger Fry, Virginia Woolf, and a Nobel Prize winner, Bertrand Russell. Though the streets remain the same as ever, the water that used to move the mill and the people who live in Jägen now are not those of long ago. But history repeats itself, doing just what Brennan did 50 years ago, a young Anglo-American woman, Margaret Osborne, who came to know Jägen one day, decided to stay for good with her two children. Margaret, who is totally integrated into this small rural community, will soon be married to a simple shepherd who lives up there in the mountains. generation of the 60s, Margaret has found her community and a Kathmandu in Jaeger. The rich heiress who has traveled all over the world as far as Alaska in search of a paradise of peace and happiness now works in the fields together with other women who do the farming while their parents, their children, their brothers and sisters emigrate to Germany or make money from the tourist boom at the seaside resorts. No different from elsewhere, Spain sees her people leave the country for the city. And just like all the rest of the women, Margaret has to work hard. She does not mind, because in Jägen, far from the Spain of the sophisticated seaside, the motorways and industrial development, Margaret has learned how to smile, while her hands are gradually covered with calluses. In the afternoons, when she sits down in the village square to sew, the girls teach her what she never learned at a university. of this compatriot of his who followed his path 50 years later did surprise Gerald Brennan, though he knows perfectly well how difficult it is to resist the charm of a village in which at the height of the 20th century the rites and customs are like those that date back to long ago and where everything evokes past cultures and other civilizations.
Margaret, I'm very surprised to come here and find you, a young English and American girl, doing exactly what I did uh, 50 years or more than 50 years ago. It's very strange to see that in a girl, I think. Can you explain to me why, you, why you've come here? Well, I've, I've always been looking for a calm, peaceful place to live. I've been in Italy in a small village also, but when I came here, first the landscape captivated me, and then the village itself, its people, were very, very friendly, uh, and also the faithfulness that there is in the village. In the Civil War, there were a lot of killings in Spain amongst villagers denouncing other villages. None of that occurred here. No. It's all like one great big happy family. Yes. And that's why I like it so much. Well, that's lovely, and yet, uh, I remember I came here for a few years. I never thought that I could stand it for, for too long because it is so remote from what's called civilization. But you intend to, to stay here always, I think you tell me. Yes, yes, I, I could never leave here. It has too powerful a, a meaning for me. I think in today in the world people want money, they want ambition, and I don't feel that desire. I only want to arrive at a, at a peaceful old age. Well, I think that's... Uh, Wonderful idea. It's really a religious idea of wanting to have the good life. Where well, one noticed the laxity was at Sunday morning mass. The women wearing either black mantillas or head handkerchiefs would fill up the front of the church, while at the back stood a group of men who talked and chatted and occasionally even smoked during the service. Other men stood in the square outside and considered that they had heard mass if they had merely looked through the door and crossed themselves when they heard the bell for the elevation. Dogs ran in and out, children played, and there was a general atmosphere of indifference. Spaniard respects his animals and shows great patience with them. He is not in a hurry to get back to his tea, so he has plenty of time to give to them. The dog is not a noble animal in Spain, but it is in England. The reason for this is that in Spanish villages and working class streets, it gets so much tormented by little boys that it grows up to be cowardly. Then it forfeits respect. Yet the men, in their undemonstrative way, are often as attached to their dogs as the women are to their cats. They do not make a fuss of them, but they admit them as companions. If one sees so many half-starved dogs and cats in Spain, that is simply because the poor do not have enough food to give them. Real love of animals is a feeling that can only develop when a certain standard of living has been attained. I think that what I said in my book about the treatment of animals in the south of Spain is changing very rapidly. That is because people uh, have got more means, more money, and can feed them better, and also because they take more interest in them. In this, certainly that's true in this village, which is full of dogs and cats, which are very well looked after and fed. Of course, the village people, like Spaniards everywhere, like to go out and shoot tiny little birds. They like them to eat. They season their food. But there are certain birds they never shoot. They don't touch uh, swallows or, 
called nightingales. I was very rather moved to see that uh, there are a great many nightingales, I should say, in uh, all around Yechin. But I was moved to see that one, which I had known before particularly well, was still there, still at the same tree, in the same place, with its nest in the brambles at the foot of the tree. Below the upper mill, and issuing from it, ran the stream in which the women washed clothes. Laundering was the great occupation of the female half of the population, and many married women practiced it on every fine day of the year. They enjoyed the vigorous exercise, the splash of the water, the open air, and above all the gossip, which made the lavadero in a special way backed up. Any man who ventured to linger by it would be subjected to the fire of their critical remarks and driven off. spring of water in the country. It is also the best taste. Spaniards, as has been often remarked, prize water not only for its abundance, but for its flavor. Their palate, which is so often so crude in its appreciation of wine, is of an exquisite sensibility when it is confronted with a natural liquid. The taste of ours, coming straight as it did from deep underground fissures and caverns in the stratocrystalline rocks, where it had lain maturing after drifting down from the snow, was particularly satisfying. chickens that we kill and fish comes about two or three times a week but mostly we just eat uh, beans and what comes from what we get each season from the fields. The water is very good for cooking here. It's have, good for cooking. Uh, very good, yeah. It's good for drinking too. It's very good water. When I lived here before I drank water but now I become a wine drinker and I don't care for it anymore. When I first came here I couldn't distinguish between the different no. kinds of water but I oh, can now. Yes. I can distinguish between our village water and the water of the next villages. Well, you're really becoming completely Spanish. You see, that's wonderful, I think. Yeah. Well, the water is very good. Yes. One of my principal amusements lay in giving dances. There are no sleepy little villages in Andalusia, and except in August, when the men were out threshing all night, there were dances in one house or another every week. Those I gave were popular because my house was a large one. All I had to do was to buy a bottle of anise and a packet of tobacco and arrange for a lutist and a couple of guitarists to come in. Invitations would go out to a few families and then as the music struck up and those inviting, reiterating chords floated through the air, the girls, accompanied by their mothers or married sisters, would begin to arrive. No one could be excluded. The front door had to stand ajar, so that before long, perhaps a hundred people would have pushed their way in.
Mr. Brennan, is when you talk in your book about the Mesa Camilla. Well, you see, this is what's called a Mesa Camilla here. It's a round wooden table with very long skirts, and at the bottom of it, there's a charcoal brazier. Let us say, nowadays they have electric braziers. braziers. But uh, my idea was a bit fantastic. I suggested that when in the 17th century this table began to be used, um, uh, it really led in many ways to the decadence of Spain at that time. The whole family would crowd round it, perhaps six, five or six people, but more likely about 10 or 15, children and young people and fathers and mothers and grandmothers, and they'd all sit huddled there looking towards one another, sometimes playing cards, but always stuck like that and in this uh, a kind of freezing of the family in this way. And it made Spaniards turn inwards into family life instead of outwards towards work and the world and life and so on. The only people it benefited were the uh, young engaged couples, the novios, because they, of course, the, they put their hands under the skirts of the table and uh, hold hands or something of that sort under it. Otherwise, they never had a chance of touching one another or even of talking to one another in private. Yes, well, that's still true today, true today. about the, the, the novios. The novios. Yes, there's a certain more liberty because now young men marry to other villages yes. uh, instead of just in the village. Yes. But generally, even if they've been several years working in foreign places, they usually come back to marry within this region. They never ma hardly ever married and, foreign people. And now they can, now they're allowed to walk up and down the road alone, aren't they? Yes, yes, they do. Yeah. But then they're, they're, everybody else is walking up and down the road no, also, too, so they never course, really they are alone. Never really no. alone. Well, that's changing very fast in the, uh, in the rest of Spain, I think, but this is a very old-fashioned village. This is a very, old very traditional, yes. yes it's very traditional. And then when the novio uh, can only go and see, if it's in a village, inside the village, his novia, he goes and sees her every night. But if she comes from another village, he goes and sees her on Thursday and Sunday nights only. Yes. Only on, it always has to be Thursday and Sunday nights. Yes, yes. Yes, it's a curious rigidity. Yes, very it's different, custom. very different to England and the United States. Yes, very. The first thing that comes to my mind when I think of Virginia as she was in those days, and particularly as I saw her in the quiet seclusion of my house, is her beauty. I recall her face in the firelight, then the gaily bantering tone in which she spoke, and Leonard's easy companion for one. An English lady, country bred and thin, her wide open eyes scanning the distance, who has completely forgotten herself in her delight at the beauty of the landscape, and at the novelty of finding herself in such a remote and Arcadian spot. She seemed, though quiet, as excited as a schoolgirl on a holiday. I remember this place particularly well because 50 years ago I came here with Virginia Woolf and her husband Leonard. She was enchanted with all the country around here. We used to go for walks morning and evening over the hills with their huge olive trees and this frame of enormous mountains behind them at a great distance. Then I remember in this place is here there are very tall poplars and the whole place is green and fresh and there are cherry trees. We picked some cherries <coughs> and she put them in her hat. She was as gay as a schoolgirl when she, when she was out of doors in the country. Then in the evenings we sat and we talked or rather she talked and uh, by the fire because it's chilly in the evenings and uh, uh, she, she was in a kind of dream about the whole place. Uh, six months or a year later when I saw her in London, she said this had made an enormous impression on me. It was a kind of Arcadia, far from the civilization, and yet a place that was completely happy and completely peaceful. She often remembered it.
More shocking to my mind than the private failings of our priests was the condition of the cemetery. When the wall round it fell down, no money could be found for repairing it. And for years, the dogs used to climb in, dig up the recently interred bodies. The soil was too shallow to allow a deep burial and eat them. Cemeteries are usually well looked after in Spain, and this oriental disregard is something that I had never heard of anywhere else. Like most of the villages of the Sierra Nevada, the Aachen was composed of two barrios or quarters built at a short distance from one another. The Barrio de Arriva, or Upper Quarter, which was the one in which I lived, began just below the road and ended at the church. Here there was a level space, some two or three acres in extent, a break in the endless slope, which was given over to cultivation. And immediately below that, the Barrio de Abajo, or Lower Quarter, began. The extraordinarily strong feelings of attachment which Spaniards have to their native place showed themselves even in the case of these barrios. But although there was no difference in their social composition, there was a decided feeling of rivalry between them. People made their friends chiefly of the one in which they lived, and if they had to move house, avoided settling in the other. and in private quarrels, the two barrios tended to take different sides. But since there were no obstacles to intermarriage, the feeling never went very deep and did not, of course, compare with the gulf that divided one pueblo or village from another. Politics is the primary and fundamental passion of all Spaniards, the frame into which they pour their unconscious, aggressive energies. Love is quite unable to compete with it, and in fact has never done so in any age of Spanish history. It is for this reason that the ages of love in Spain have always been the ages of political stagnation and oppression. Every, every dictatorship is born under the sign of Venus, and those winged patent leather hats of the, of the civil guard that shine so brightly in the sun, are, oh, as any 16th century poet would have seen, as Aras de Cupido. My village had little use for the benefits provided by science. It could have had electric light, like both Valor and Athena, but through its indifference and apathy, it failed to secure the services of the electricity company. It could also have had the telephone, but when the wires were brought along the road, it turned down the offer of a call box. What, if not unreasonably asked, was the point of wasting good money on a thing which no one would use? Well, now they do use telephone and light. Yeah, the light's quite good too, isn't it? It's yes, it, light. yes, they do, and there's about 12 telephones in the village and a lot of televisions, transistor radios that they brought from Germany. The people who go to Germany come back with, with transistor radios. Well, that's a terrible pity because in my time, everyone uh, walking off to his work in the morning with his horse or mule used to sing coplas, that is, uh, flamenco songs. And that appears to have completely gone out in Spain in the last 10 years. Yes, we people don't sing now. No, they they don't sing. The women sing when they're whitewashing. But, white but the washing. men don't sing. No. Hardly ever. No. Well, I think it's a terrible pity that. When they, I heard you brought the first Victrola to the village. The what? The first Victrola you brought to the village. Yes, I brought one, yes, a little gramophone. But uh, with flamenco records in it. Yes. Put on in the evenings. 
Well, here now they have the gramophone in the dance hall. In the dance hall, yes. yes. And people, uh, when they dance, they dance to modern music, modern. not flamenco. No, no. no. Well, it's not always so easy to dance to flamenco. You've got to dance different way, yes. usually. The other dances were very simple. They just went round in circles, hugging one another, and absolutely solemn faces. Yes. And all packed together, very close. Yes. Well, now they dance all the latest dances. All the latest dances. where I spent five or six of the best years of my life. I had a long search for it. I came walking on foot from Granada and visiting every village on the way, several hundred miles. And I at last found a house that was free, it was empty, and it was not too expensive. I used to pay, I think it was six pounds every year for the whole house and a little bit of garden. And it was a very large house with about 15 rooms in it. But now it's completely changed. The, it's divided up into five different flats because there's no longer any place in these villages for uh, large landowners who have large houses. This is the patio of the house where I lived for so many years. Uh, you can see on each side a stone bench. That was a bench on which the beggars or poor people sat when they came to the house. As it was a large house, a good many came, not from the village. They would come straight up to the door, but those people who, those many poor people who wandered about the roads going from village to village. And they would sit here, and the, 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 the person who worked for me would see them, and they would be offered bread and oil, very rarely money. In those days, not only the poor, but other, a great many other people would like to eat a loaf, piece a cut from a loaf of bread with a little oil poured into it. I, of course, didn't do that. I like butter. But butter was a great rarity in Spain. Only the rich ate it. In the last century, the rich families of Malaga were known popularly as the butter people, because they uh, ate butter which came in tins from Holland. I liked butter too, but it was not because I was rich. It was because I was English. <laughs> You see, this house was not very luxurious. Yet it belonged to the richest man in the village, which you might call the boss of the village. Very different to the bosses or caciques whom one reads about in the big cities. He had only four or five men 
who worked on his land. And uh, he paid them two pesitas, 50 a day. Well, you see, that was very little. When I stayed at a small, cheap hotel on the coast, an inn, you might say, I paid six or seven pesitas for the night and the, uh, and the bed. And that is an enormous amount less than what you pay in a hotel today. But the, the rich man of this village, this, the owner of this house, had two luxuries. One was he had a water closet. No one else had. They just went down to the stables. And then he had running water. has found himself in his village south from Granada, where time seemed to have stood still. Fifty years after his discovery of Jägen, and following in his and Margaret Osborne's wake, English and American travelers are beginning to arrive and to ride on horseback around the Shangri-La, hidden away in the mysterious Andalusia, just as if they were on a pilgrimage to a sanctuary. Thank you. 